go. He is an actor, director, and author, and the audiobook narrator of Return to Eden, its anthology of 33 essays describing his experiences as an army advisor in Vietnam, life as an actor, and his return to Vietnam in 2004, a lifelong musician. Tucker performed all vocals on the Delta Blues album, Incarnation, the Robert Johnson Project. Please welcome. I had been semi-conscious for several hours, still in the space of reflection. The morphine had long since worn off, but I felt little pain, more discomfort from the IV, soldiers, trach, and the absence of my accustomed alertness. It was a dreamlike state, sat in an unfamiliar hospital ward, unending rows of beds and cold, bitterly cold. How had I not before noticed how absurdly cold it was? I began to shiver, which made me more aware of the still more sutures, and then I remembered to check my leg. My God, how could I have forgotten about my leg? As I blocked the blood pulsing from my throat, I remember thinking, if they give save my leg, fuck it. I ain't coming back. Uh, how reckless. How trivial a leg in comparison to continued existence. Yet at the time, aware that I was dying, I was quite clear on this point. Life as I knew it involved two legs. Yeah. And I was not willing to carry on with less. It was a vivid but passing thought. There were fanning and pressing concerns at the time the six men around me who lay bleeding and died. On this mission, I alone spoke English. And as always, I carried the radio. Obviously, I managed the successful extraction for it. I now lay in a hospital bed. Rather than within the row of bags we used for those whose day had not gone well. There was a sacred trust between my soldiers and I. Under my command, you will come under fire. Face injury, perhaps death. But no, when I will move heaven and earth to support your efforts. And dead or alive, I will bring you home. On my first night with my team, after a bloody VC attack, my troops watched me take our wounded outside and pull a little wire. Absurd as it sounds, we had no chopper pad inside. And raising the stone in the pitch black girl tonight, I tied it in the dust off Trump. I've been perhaps too busy earlier for fear, but as I stood there in the darkness, beneath the flashing light visible for several kilometers, I felt cold sweat dripping down my back, and I was as scared as I will ever be. I drew no fire for which I still give thanks. And from that night on, they fought bravely for me, knowing that I would stand up for them. And at first light, I had a squad even worked creating a fucking chopper bed inside our friend with a wire. Said the teacher. A nurse approached my bed and I spoke to her. It's so cold. I tried to say, but no sound came out. Then I remembered I could no longer speak, had been forced to whisper into the radio for 30 minutes, trying to raise a rescue force while we waited for the VC to finish us off. She placed my finger over the opening in my trach and I tried to get him. It was a stranger's hoarse whisper that came from my body, but she understood me and explained that the ward was intentionally kept cold to cut down on infection. She said I'd soon become accustomed to it. Bullshit. I thought I didn't realize how weak I was, exhausted with just the effort of speaking a few words. She smiled, patted my hand, and left to attend to the dozens around me. To my mouth was an unconscious marine, receiving plasma and antibiotics from two IDs. I could see no bandages, which meant nothing. Everyone in this ward was seriously fucked up. Not all of us would make it. And some cried out for adhering to their misery. Their moans implied life, hurts, 
living is pain. I am weary of the struggle to take one more breath. It was curious that I hadn't noticed it at first, but there was a continuous low level of human suffering. We were one collective open wound, losing the essence of life and its fellow traveler anguish. Oddly, I welcomed the sensations of my pain. It proved to me that I still lived. As long as I heard of my life, simple equation. I got back a few hours to my first return to consciousness. It was unlike awakening from a dream, however bad the dream had been. Clarity gently came quickly to me. I trained myself to awaken suddenly with full awareness, but this was very different. I don't was Shitsu. I was. I am. What could that be? Without warning, my eyes quickly filled and the tears spilled over. Ears full of tears. With that which play my bill gun so eloquently described, tears are the excrement of life and need no cost. I slowly accepted what must be so somehow I didn't be brought back. Give me a second chance. I remember that moment on the job of acceptance. Was steady ten feet in front of me to not lose consciousness. I tied my sweatband tight as I could around my throat and began to key my radio handset to my team to anyone May Day. May Day. It took more than 30 minutes to raise a response. And then we waited. When help finally arrived, I noticed that I was now floating high overhead. A neutral observer. I had left my body. Okay. This dispassionate doppelganger watched as medics with scalpels ripped off my tiger for things with a fishing dispatch. I lay below naked as the day I was born, while they guided me and assessed my wounds. When my body was lifted onto a litter, I saw my beret fall off into the mud. <clears throat> and then just as suddenly I returned to that body. In the middle of that chopper, I remember the blood and the morphine they gave me in triage. I remember the skeptical looks of those caring for me. Not insensitive, just realistic. It was a busy Sunday afternoon in the walk. And some time later, on the table, my job done. I finally let it go. Good. I died. I slowly accepted what must be so somehow I had been brought back to life, given a second chance. The surgeons had turned away and said, next. All but one. Dr. Kirk Davis. Who persisted and he made my heart beat once again. Hmm. All this I learned later. I met him at a reunion in Chicago 14 years ago hmm. and thanked him. He remembered me. Hmm. He remembered my surgery, which was at that time in the history. Move. And cleared it in the Vietnam Vascular Registry. <laughs> His daughter became a Facebook friend. And she said he once told her that my injuries hadn't been covered in med school. <laughs> he said he was improvising. But he knew he could do no harm. Because I was already dead. <laughs> I'd never witnessed a miracle. I'm not even sure that I believe in miracles, but something profoundly miraculous had just occurred, and I was filled with that light, which becomes the temporary companion of all who have faced and accepted their death, and then had it postponed. The light always fades eventually, being human. We forget how ephemeral, how conditional is our existence. Yeah. My tears continue, 
seemingly inexhaustible, and I'm struck with the realization that it had been a long pain since I had been moved to tears. Hmm. Not since college, years before, when I felt shame for having struck and body the man of a fist fight. In all the months of my command, amidst the pain and death and dismemberment I had witnessed and had caused, I had never once wept or experienced grief, anger, yes, and bitterness and disappointment and disgust. Enough of grief. So I wept, and perhaps my tears were the real evidence of my rebirth, for they reflected a humanity that had been somehow lacking in the months before. They were tears of joy. And they continued unabated as I drifted off to sleep. When I woke again, it was day. I knew this only because the Lord was now fully lit. Yes. And I was once again aware of the better cleaning in the room. I longed for a blanket. Only a thin night shred and cotton top sheet between me and the brutal air conditioning. I am not getting your story. <laughs> <laughs> A curse me to the triple digit temperatures of the Mekong Delta. Cool for me was 90 degrees. This was Arctic. And as I shivered, I felt the raw, dull ache of my body and knew with certainty that I would go quite mad if the narcotics they had obviously given me ever wore boasted. To distract myself, I took in my immediate surroundings. To my right was the board wall. Beyond the hallway, across from me, an endless row of beds filled with all manner of broken bodies. And to my left, a young Marine just beginning to awaken. I watched with growing interest. I intuited that he was returning from a journey to get champ. <laughs> Not just war, but afterlife. <laughs> I watched my own discovery of rebirth play across his features, and felt almost like a warrior, witnessing this most private of moments. But I knew we had something unique in common, and anticipated training my insights for his. I watched and waited to catch his eye, unwilling to break the silence with a hoarse whisper as he took stock of his wounds. My eyes never left his face, and I saw his groggy ecstasy dissolve to disbelief and then remembering, and then to despair, as his mind took in the implications of the sheets beneath his waist. I looked down to see the two columns beneath, beneath the sheets, one ending abruptly, just above where his right knee should have been. Mm. His head fell back onto the pillow, and I was finally able to tear my eyes away. As I stared at the blessed lights above, I felt sadness for his loss, disappointment, knowing we would probably not be comparing notes at eight times soon. Perfect. And a small, insidious, unwelcome clean. How unworthy, how uncharitable, but it remained for some moments. A guilty yet undeniable sense of joy that it was his slave rather than mine, that was lost. Thank you, Dr. Cardenas. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Oh. Thank <laughs> you.